All right. I have a pile of data for you to start playing with. Did I hear a yay? Yay. Oh, I love this enthusiasm. One, two. I would like you to pass those out. I'd be delighted because then you could pass these out too. Now what you have in front of you is a set of data. It's the actual and average temperatures for June a few years ago. And the question we have in front of us, someone said, man, that was a hot June. And I can attest to that. I was actually, for a while, my wife and I had a retail nursery and landscaping business. So I was out doing manual labor that June. Pick and shovel. It was hot. So how hot was it? Was it hotter than a typical June? Now these kind of questions are kind of tricky to answer, aren't they? <coughs> it's not like who weighs the most, who has the highest IQ, who can throw it the furthest. But which month is this month unusually hot? So let's go through our process now, and you should have uh, on the second. This is your raw data. Can I hold this for a second here? On this sheet of paper, you're going to create three kinds of uh, frequency diagrams or tables. <coughs> I've already put the classes there for you, but let's just observe and look at the raw data for a minute and see that how we go about coming up with those. What's the lowest uh, temperature? We have both. We have average temperatures. Actually, we have an average high and an actual high. What are the range of values for the average high in June? We short one of those. Uh, short one of the first. Do so you have an extra one here? Yeah, they definitely got. my range of values for the average high? 79 to 85. And how about the actual high? 77 to 95. All right, in that process that I, in the previous slide, how to come up with the number of classes and the class uh, limits, recall the first step in the recipe was find the range of data values and then the, the difference. So let's take this one. I've got a difference of about 20, 20 degrees. And if I wanted, so there's 20 degrees difference. If I wanted uh, five <coughs> classes, then my, my width would have to be about four. And if you look at what I actually proposed here, we're starting out at 75 to 79, 80 to 84. What is the class width in this frequency table? Four. Remember, it's successive lows, successive starts of the class. So that's, this is the kind of thinking you'd go through to get the classes to begin with. And there's no absolute right or wrong. There's just kind of a process. Yes? Is it 20 over 5, the number of classes, and then the width is 4? That would be the kind of original calculation you go through to get started on this. Yeah. But the, so the 20 over 5 is the number of classes? Yeah. Or no, yeah, 20 over, I'm sorry, 5 classes. This is the total difference between the min and the max. This is the number of classes. That's my target. That means the class width would be four. But remember I said pick easy numbers to work with. It's going to be five, ten, multiples of five and ten to make it easy to do the calculation. 
so in this example, the class width is actually five. All right, you've got the raw data. Now, what I'd like you to do for our, and each row, starting at your right, my left, find your position, first, second, third, fourth, whatever seat you're in, cadet. Six. If you are an even number, you're going to be working with a column that has the average high. If you're an odd number, you're going to be working with a column that says actual high. And I want you to create a frequency table from that raw data. Okay? Go do that. And then the first two cadets done for an even the odds get to display their work up on the blackboard. Anybody confused, disoriented? Dismayed? Depressed? You're depressed? <coughs> Say when. Anybody not understand what they're doing? Yes. So relative frequency or both? Uh, we haven't got done relative frequency. Right now, we're just doing frequency. As soon as we finish this table, we'll quickly do the next two. Okay. Are you done? I invite you to the blackboard to share with us. One, two, <coughs> so you were an odd. You did this one. The first even. Do I have an even done? <coughs> Be shy. <coughs> These are all up in angels, so I wouldn't worry about writing down every every word there. Are you done with evens? All right. Yeah, why don't you do it there, put them right next to each other, because we're going to look at these two distributions, these frequency tables, and see that might help us understand if this June was an unusually hot month. Do these tables help us answer the question, was June unusually hot? What do you think? Could it Hamilton? Was it a hot month? Yes. 
Because. Because the average uh, for 85 and I is 5, and the actual is 16. You said, uh, did you say the average? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. The Let's not use that term because these aren't actually averages, but we could say the class, the temperature range that occurs most frequently <coughs> on average is 84. <coughs> and on average, it never gets above 90 on average. But what about this month? 80 to 84, we only had two days, but all the rest of the days were higher than that. The distribution of the high temperatures per day has certainly shifted, hasn't it, down in this direction from the average to the actual. <coughs> Is that clear to everyone? So without looking at each of those we have 60 different numbers to look at, by putting them in a simple table like this, you can get kind of a shape of the distribution and you can draw some general conclusions. And that's what we're doing, getting general conclusions from the data, descriptive statistics. Now you can see in, in this year I had eight days that are above 90, and on average, the average temperature, none of them are above 90. Yes? There are six days in the United Hmm? For the actual temperature? There are six? There are six days in the United Oh, all right, so it was even worse. These should add up to 30. I didn't check. No, the one above it. Oh, that's six? And this is three? Yes. All right. So nine, that's almost one-third of the days is above 90. Okay? Now, that's one kind of a table. That's called a frequency table. Frequency tables, you're just counting. Define your classes and you count. Now, in a relative frequency distribution, we're going to use the same classes that we've already defined, but now instead of raw counts, we're going to do percentages or proportions. There were 30 days. What percent or proportion of the days are in each class? So the total number of Frequencies, well, in our case, the total number of days in the month of June, 30. You go through your frequency diagram and divide each of those by 30, and that's the relative frequency for that class. If you express it as a decimal, that's the proportion or relative frequency, or you can multiply it by 100, and it would be a percentage. So please do that now if you haven't already. Thank you. Make a relative frequency table. And we, when you're done with it, to double check your work, this next page, here's an example from the IQ scores. These are the frequencies, and these are the relative frequencies. And note, these, the relative frequencies, should add up to be exactly either 100%, if you express them as percentages, or 1, if you express it as a, a decimal. This turns out to be a useful way to look at data, particularly when I'm uh, comparing two frequencies. Anybody have an idea of why we bothered to do this? What's the advantage? Well, let's suppose we're studying, again, heights of students. And we're going to study EMI and Virginia Tech. And if we did frequency diagrams, BMI will say the range of uh, 72 to 75 inches tall, and I might have 120. At Virginia Tech, maybe I have 5,280. And I could do that for each 
class. And then I wanted to compare and say, well, who's taller overall? Students at VMI or Virginia Tech? Can I use that table? What's the shortcoming? Go ahead. Well, you just take the total number of cadets at VMI and then do the relative frequency of the percentage and then do the same thing with tech and see the percentage is higher. Excellent. That's exactly it. The downfall of just frequencies is they depend on how big your population or sample is to begin with. And let's face it, Virginia Tech's a lot larger than VMI, so in any one of these classes, there's going to be much bigger numbers here. I can't compare this number with this number. It's just a count frequency. But I can compare relative frequencies. I could say if this was 8% uh, of the VMI class and this was 12.2% of the Virginia Tech class, then it makes sense to compare them because they're percentages or ratios, not raw counts. And that's why we have this kind of frequency table. All right, relative frequency tables. Another kind of frequency table, and this is a cumulative. Notice in the previous two, the column definitions didn't change, did they? They're the same. Their range of values. When we go to the cumulative tables, as the term suggests, we're accumulating counts as we go from the lowest class to the upper class. So to be precise, we have to rewrite our class definitions. This first class becomes all the IQ scores less than or equal to 69. Well, there's two of those. Now the second class, remember it's cumulative, so I'm going to include everything in this class and the ones that preceded. So there's 35, and to be precise about the definition of that class, it's IQ scores less than or equal to 89. And so on. You just keep adding successively the classes before. So go ahead and practice this with the temperature data. You'll see there's space in the bottom of the sheet to do a cumulative frequency diagram for those temperatures. is the, I'll call it the shape of the distribution, though you can, it's hard to say a, a table has any shape. Uh, but there are some key distributions that turn up a lot. And if we sample from a data and we do a frequency table and it looks like one of those distributions, then we can, uh, that determines what kind of statistical tests we can do later on. The most common shape we see out there is the good old bell curve. And we have a name for that. That's the normal distribution. And you might say, well, what did you just draw? Yeah, you drew a curve, but what is that? Well, for now, 
I'll, we'll explain more precisely later what we mean by that. But what I want you to think of is that I took a, a frequency dis a frequency table, then drew bars that represent the height of the bar represents the number of uh, occurrences in each class. So the height of this bar represents how many occurrences were in that class. This shape, <coughs> starting low, gradually building up to a peak in the center, and then decreasing to a small number in the end, <coughs> that general shape is, is indicative of a normal distribution. And we run across those a lot. Symmetry, high in the middle, smaller values on the end, gradually building to a peak in the middle. <coughs> okay, some real live data. The first, yeah, let's practice interpreting this. This table represents the age of actors and actresses when they received an Academy Award. And this is the actresses and the actress. Look at that. Can you discern any difference in those distributions? And does that data support a claim? Can you think of a claim that that data supports? Two times we've got a data value 61 to 70. 
in this population. Would 45 be that line from the debate? In population B, no. 45 itself is not an outlier because it's a frequency. It's how many times people got a score between 21 and 30. Actually, I'm glad you, <coughs> glad you stated it that way because that's a common conception. The outliers are these numbers, right? They're the frequency. The outliers would be numbers in this range. And in this distribution, I've got two occurrences of values 61 to 70 and none in the previous range, in the previous class. So these are candidates for outliers. I think they're outliers. So would um, 21 to 30 in population B be higher? No, no. That's just a class that has a lot of occurrences. It's the most frequently occurring class. It's just the opposite of outlier. So 51 to 60 would be higher. In population B, there really aren't any outliers. Remember, these are the cumulative count of uh, scores that were in these ranges. Yes. So, the out, an outlier would be, <coughs> I had five scores between 41 to 50. Five scores. So it's not five that could potentially be an outlier. It would be a score in this range that might be an outlier. But it's really not because it's not separated by a big gap from the rest of the score. But here I have this class where there's nothing. And then all of a sudden, two scores pop up down here. If you've got translate in your mind, that two there stands for two scores, two test scores that were in this range. So we went from a 50 all the way to something between 60 and 70, with nothing in between. So it takes you to 70 to Yeah, this class okay. is potentially the ally. Right? Okay. I think that's a wrap for today, and I'll see you Friday.